Well, today I have a mystery guest with me, and we're going to talk about some issues about the beginning of life and the end of the life and what that should look like as a Christian. If you're interested, stay tuned. This is the Bible Sojourner, where we discuss issues related to the Bible, theology, and culture. I'm your host, Peter Gaiman, professor of Old Testament and biblical languages at Shepherd's Theological Seminary. Shalom and welcome. Thanks for joining. Well, today we have a special guest with us, and I am very pleased and honored to have my very own father on the show. So, Dad, Tim Gaiman, thanks for joining us. Good to be here, Peter. Well, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, you think about, okay, what would be profitable for people? And one of the things that I think a lot of people would really enjoy learning about would be having the beginning of life, the end of life, how all that goes together. And you've seen a lot more of life than I have because you're what, like 37, something like that? Uh, Something (laughs) like that and a a little change. Um, But yeah, it's a a great topic to think about. I I don't think it's an enjoyable topic for people because we all have this idea apparently that – the end of or the the beginning of life is great. You know, we we enjoy that. We enjoy having our kids and and as life unfolds, but we don't like thinking about the end of life. And uh, apparently, we have this idea that uh, somehow we will be perhaps the first person ever to escape it, uh, but that's not reality. So, especially as Christians, it it really will behoove us to think about uh, finishing well, and. Um, I've thought about this some in the past, but now in recent uh, years and even days, um, your mother and I have uh, have had four parents who are alive uh, to around the age of 90. And finally, my father-in-law just passed away last October, and we still have three very elderly parents. And so just end-of-life issues are forefront in our minds and caring for them. And it has kind of forced the issue for us and uh, fortunately, I think we can think through these issues biblically and really uh, be a testimony for the Lord and his glory right to the end. Hmm. That's so good. And I think, you know, looking at this episode, kind of what my goal is, is to kind of paint the beginning of life and the end of life sequence and maybe what the differences are and more importantly, how we think about those things biblically. So, uh, just jumping right into right into the questions here. Um, when you're thinking about the start of life, you said that's more enjoyable for parents typically, and but I've recognized, and I'm sure you have as well. Not every parent parents the same, and so biblically speaking, what is probably the main motivation for parents when when you're talking to parents, counseling them? What do you tell them? This is your priority as a biblical parent. Here, here's a newborn child born into this world. How do you start that life process? Well, that's a great question. And uh, it's important for Christian parents especially to realize that uh, good parenting and as a result, uh, a good child, if I can use that terminology, it's not just going to happen by accident. It has to be very deliberate action on the way of a parent. And it really grieves me just to see new parents kind of stumbling through life and it appears like they're just hoping everything will turn out and uh, you know it just really doesn't have to be that way and it shouldn't be that way and of course the ultimate goal for children for your children as a parent is that they would know the savior and regardless of what else happens in life they can be a nobel prize winner they could be a, a a high government official they could be very successful in the business world but in the end, if they end up going to hell as a successful business person, I mean, what has really been accomplished? I mean, that, that is a real tragedy, and it happens too often. So Christian parents, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, first things first, right. the gospel first. Hmm. No, that's so crucial. And I, I think a lot of times we overcomplicate things in trying to— and, and Life is complicated in many ways, but a lot of times we make it too complicated, too fast, and we need to try to simplify it, uh, bring the gospel to bear. And so so I guess one of my questions would be in trying to do that just practically, and this is a question that I have with our young adult group often when we're working through parenting issues, what does that look like practically? What are some things that 
parents can do just day in, day out to just really apply the gospel to parenting? How, how's that going to look? Yeah, that's a great question. And really, we've already touched on this, and we need to keep coming back to the simple basics always. And yes, things get complicated, and yes, we can study in more depth, but we're always drawn back um, to the gospel and really foundational things such as um, Christian parents just bringing your kids to church and have them involved in church life, you know, from from the earliest days on. And your goal, a worthy goal, would be that they never remember a time when they weren't involved in the church. Because remember, uh, again, a very simple concept is um, the church is God's plan A, and there's no plan B. And so kids need to be involved in church, and that's where the gospel is going to be reinforced. A couple other important things is um, just seeing your faith as parents lived out before them every day. The way you relate to your spouse, um, the way you make decisions, let them see you you praying over important things. And of course, um, there's always the, the situation where you will have to discipline your kids and make but sure— But you never had to discipline us. Uh, once or twice, I believe. <laughs> Um, but you know, you make sure that they know that that's in love. And mm-hmm. of, of course, nobody likes discipline when it's happening, but over time, a child can see that it's for their own good. And, uh, of course we all make mistakes doing that as parents, but God is gracious and you do the best you can and you keep learning. And, um, remember, you know, again, a very foundational thing that in life, God is making you more like Christ. So your first day as a parent, you bring the new baby home. You may not be as Christ-like as you'd like to be, but in five or ten years down the road, you should be more Christ-like. And so God is gracious. He'll make up for your faux pas there along the way. Um, But some of these very foundational things, you just stick with them and realize that this is a long-term proposition. You have, uh, you know, for sure 15, 20 years you know, that you really have influence over your children. And after that, the relationship changes significantly. Hmm. And that might be worth talking about too. But I did want to zero in on one thing that you specifically said, because I think that's just so crucial to recognize is the is the genuine nature of modeling godliness for children. And chil- I mean, obviously, we have very young kids, six, four, two. Uh, but I've even already seen how our children mimic and understand whether or not we're genuine or whether we believe something based on how we act. And there are so many times that they ask, well, why didn't this happen? Because given what you've told me, we expected this to happen. Like, why did we miss devotions today or something like that? And they can recognize whether or not it was a legitimate reason for missing those things. Right, right. Yeah, there's, uh, it's surprising. There's no fooling small kids. Even even age two, three, four on up, um, you can say things when you didn't think they were listening, but they're always listening and watching. They, they, they may not have eye contact with you, but as a parent, you are the central focus of their lives, and they're going to miss very little. And so just realize that, again, the small things, how you're living out your faith, is really going to have a huge impact. Mm, that's That's crucial. I think... I don't know if you told me this originally or if I had picked this up somewhere along the way, but one of the key words that I I remember in in thinking through parenting and and being trained as a parent is found in the word consistency. And kids thrive when parents are consistent of how they apply discipline, when they apply discipline, how life is structured, what to expect in the godliness of the parent, uh, prayer, all of these things. Consistency really is key. And when at least in our lives, and I'm sure this would be the same for many parents, is when that consistency goes out the window, you know, that's when the family often arrives into chaos of some kind. Yeah, that's a really good observation, Peter. And I, I think the underlying part of that, that that makes it so important is that as people, we like things to be fair. And uh, when a parent is consistent, uh, a young mind quickly kind of uh, processes that as, oh, that's fair. That's when I do this, that's what happens. When my brother does that, that's what happens. 
And uh, so that that's a very easy thing to process there because fairness is closely linked. And uh, when we're inconsistent, um, it not only hurts the child because they really don't know what to expect, they don't know what's expected, but as parents, that wavering in our own minds is no good for us either because then we start drifting. And uh, to be honest and, and use a, a phrase that's often used in biblical counseling, our drift is always away from the gospel, always away from truth. So consistency, so important. Hmm, no, that's, that's crucial. Well, kind of shifting gears a little bit to modern parenting. I mean, I know you parented before electricity and all that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but that would implicate myself as well. But uh, so when you're looking at, obviously, your, your kids are grown and raised. We're all married. We're all having our own kids. But you still are keeping tabs on the whole parenting process. Are there anything, is there anything that you see with regard to parents parenting today that are particular challenges that maybe you didn't have to face or it's it's kind of a new a new era maybe they're facing it in a new way that you didn't have to think about what what kind of challenges do you see today for parents yeah that's another great question peter the one uh, the immediate answer that comes to mind was summarized in a meme i recently saw and it was it went something like this the current generation uh, on the headstone of the current generation it will read entertained to death. And uh, so often parents uh, kind of take the easy way out and they use screen time to control the kids, entertain them, kind of keep them out of your hair. And I remember, well, um, you and your brothers, you know, I, I really wanted to get something done and you're just underfoot. You're in my way. You know, I, you know, and, and yes, it's important to complete the project, but how much more important maybe to interact along the way and uh, so, you know, it's a difficult thing because we have all this technology that we can use to distract kids. And I've seen it. I think everyone has seen it. I mean, it's, it's no problem to plop a kid down in front of an iPad and you've got three hours free because they're just going to sit there. And, but that's, a, that's a, very, um, a very devastating thing if you're relying on that and that because – Let's face it, 24 hours a day, or I should say every waking moment that your child has, they are being parented. And so do you want screen time parenting them? Or do you want to have the input that God intends you to have as a parent? Hmm. No, that's, that's really good. In fact, that would have been my answer to the question as well. Uh, coming at it from our perspective where we're actually with young kids and even some of our friends and and um, other church members that we associate with sometimes they'll give more screen time than our kids are used to and so that our kids will say well so and so is playing why can't we and and so we kind of have to explain that's not what we do but part of the part of the reality in in thinking through this this is an observation that actually not just Christians have observed but even secularists and non-christians have observed that when kids have an increased amount of screen time, you have incredible issues. I mean, you have social media websites coming out, and this goes beyond even just small kids, but even into teenage years. Uh, we live in the midst of the, the the least happy generation that has ever existed statistically because of the social media fiasco and increased time on that has increased uh, dissatisfaction. But with little kids specifically, some of the studies I've read talk about how increase in screen time in increases irritability, anger, uh, you know, these, which doesn't make sense. You're giving the kid what they want, but then it comes full circle to our discussion where when you feed that little me monster sometimes and give them what they want, they, then they don't want to hear no. Right. And we should even expand the thinking here and really think biblically about this. And you know, what, what is the chief end of man? to enjoy God and glorify him forever, according to the Westminster Catechism. So really, we need to ask the question for our kids and for ourselves. You know, Interestingly, the most dissatisfied generation you mentioned, we also are in the information age. We have all this information and we're dissatisfied. The reason is we don't need all this information. We need to continually be asking ourselves the question, what about the next minute in my life, the next five minutes, the next task before me is going to glorify God. Is uh, 
plopping my kid in front of the iPad going to glorify God? Uh, if I scroll through Facebook for the next 45 minutes, is that going to glorify God? And uh, most often the answer is no. There's better ways that we can be spending our time and uh, just just human interaction. You know, we've all seen the uh, the case where there's a couple people in the same room and they're texting each other. Yeah. Oh, you know, there, there's just something so wrong about that. Uh, that that we just as Christians we need to have a higher view of our purpose here than falling into those traps. Mm, no, that's that's true. And I know we have a couple parents of younger children that that listen or watch the podcast, and so I obviously want to clarify that it you know, and I'm sure you would agree with me. Um, we're not saying that uh, screen time is inherently evil or that it's sinful. Obviously, you need to hear it within the context. I think the the big part that we do need to say is that this. This cultural push is to alleviate the inconvenience of parenting. And let's just be honest, at least, I don't know, you can answer this question. I'll say parenting is the hardest thing that I've ever done, but it's also the most fulfilling. Right. And God created it that way. And uh, the most fulfilling things in life are very demanding and they require discipline on our part. And they, they're just plain hard. And uh, our, our human bent is to shy away from difficult things. We, we like ease. But uh, to really be a successful parent and to have kids that really turn out in a way that is pleasing to God, it's going to require some work and some sacrifice. Hmm. No, that's, that's huge. Now, I didn't, I didn't tell you I was going to talk about this at all beforehand, so this is a pop quiz question of sorts. But I'm curious, genuinely, uh, what when you think back on you know what God taught you through parenting, what was kind of was there any aha moment? Because I know you became a Christian. You didn't grow up Christian, but when you became a Christian, when you started to to learn from others, w- was there any big aha moment when you were you know approaching the subject of parenting in your own mind and discipleship, where there was something that really stood out to you that said you know this is this is something that's going to really benefit. Uh, you know, my wife and I, as we, as we shepherd and parent our kids, applying this to our lives every day, either biblically or just practically? Sure. Um, there's one scene that comes back to my mind, and I've related to people many times over the years. And in fact, uh, you and your younger brother were playing baseball in the front yard. And uh, that was a game that never ended. It went on from springtime after the snow melted until the the snowflakes fell the next fall. And as a result, uh, there were some well-worn grooves in the yard where home plate was and and some of the bases that were set up there. And I I like to have a nice yard. You know, I I tried to make sure the grass was growing and trimmed and so forth. And and one day I was, I, I, I must have, I don't remember specifically, but I must have been kind of uh, chewing you guys out for ripping up the yard and having the, you know, no grass around home plate and and so forth. And my loving wife, Peter's mother, pointed out to me, uh, you know, we aren't growing grass here. And uh, that was just kind of one of these aha moments that, just a minute, let's get things in perspective here. You know, when I, when I, um, look back on my life when I, when the Lord brings me into his presence, uh, how the lawn looked was going to be pretty irrelevant. But how I invested time in my children was going to be very significant. And um, just having a, an enjoyable place to play. And if you remember, many times the neighbor kids were over, which is where we wanted them. We wanted the kids playing at our house so we could keep an eye on them. I mean, that's all part of it. And so if you end up sacrificing a few things that you thought were somewhat significant in your life, like how your lawn looked, or you know, you, you pick whatever it is that could perhaps be an idol in your life, um, let's get things in the right priority order, and then, um, then we can truly please God in our parenting. Oh, that's, that's good. I, I remember those days, and Maybe you undersold it a little bit because, or undersold it a little bit because I think the the lawn was a little more than worn. So I think it was looking back as a parent. I think it was justifiable anger. It's what I think <laughs> it was. So no, I think that's good. 
Uh, so I guess kind of transitioning time periods here. So we're talking about really young kids, but, and this is, this is an area that I'm not at yet, but I know some of the listeners are, uh, how, as a parent, it seems to me that th- it's going to be a difficult transition, um, to where you are complete in absolute authority, which often I think is the most valuable lesson to teach kids is that you are not an autonomous individual. You are under authority. You're under parental authority. You're under God's authority. And that's that's true. And one of the best ways you teach that is through the parental authority. But then there's a transition at some point uh, in the teenage years, uh, somewhere along the line, uh, the way you would often phrase it, if I remember correctly, is you can go to jail for your own decisions now. And that's uh, that really stuck out to me. And h- how as parents do you kind of mentally prepare for that? How do you how do you work toward that end of of now the child is no longer under your authority, they are responsible before God for their decisions? Sure, that's a great question, uh, simply because uh, many parents have trouble processing this. Uh, and they, these can be Christian and non-Christian parents struggle with this. So what needs to happen, and it, it varies based on the individual child, but somewhere in the late teen years, um, you go from kind of being the authoritarian parent to being more the coaching parent. And I think the analogy is a good one because the coach is on the sidelines. The coach is not playing the game. And as the game is being played, uh, just visualize that you're, you're sending your child in and they're playing the game. But periodically, there's a timeout. They're, they're coming back and, and maybe getting a new play from the coach or getting some direction or or the coach has seen something that the defense is doing, so they're, they're, they're sending the, the child back in and they're playing the game. And this coaching period might last you know, two or three or four years, but somewhere around 18, 19, 20, um, the child is an adult. And, and really, many parents have trouble with this. They, they think that the, you know, this person that has been a child as long as they've known them, they're still a child. Um, unfortunately, I've talked to parents who truly think that their 22-year-old daughter who is getting married is still a child. And that, that's just a grievous thing to me. And imagine what that does to the, the young adult who is still being called a child by their parents. And uh, we need to be ready to let our kids go and let them function as adults. And um, it's a difficult thing, but that's, that's really what you've been striving for your whole life. I, I have um, reminded parents a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but none of us as parents should want a 35 or 40-year-old playing video games in our basement, and that's where they're living. Yeah. Um, but the way some people parent, that's exactly where they're headed. So we need to to really be striving for that independence as they become adults, somewhere around that 20-year mark. And it varies child to child, but um, no child should still be looking for that adult label when they're 30 years old or even 25 years old. I, I just don't think that's reality. And so parents, prepare yourself for that. That's really what you're working toward. And uh, um, I should mention, too, that you and your brothers, you still contact me for advice, and I'm willing, Almost every day. I'm willing to give it, but it's a different kind of thing. It's not authoritarian. It's not that you have to do this. It's more, well, here's what I've observed over the years, and I think this would be best. And I may even give you reasons why, and you can choose to do it or not. And if you choose not to do it, that's fine with me. I'll help you pick up the pieces later. <laughs> Um, but it, it's a whole different relationship, and it needs to be that different relationship um, because that's the way God intended it to be. Hmm. No, I think that that's, I think it's so crucial to start with the end goal in mind. So when you think about what are you actually striving for, ultimately you're not, you're not you, as a parent, you're not striving to have a child be in your home forever just as a token of who you are. You're, you're, essentially trying to strive to to help facilitate growth in this child so that they are an independent servant of the Lord, which the Lord can use in whatever way he pleases. Right, right. Yeah, we don't, um, well, we can 
when this doesn't happen, we can peel back the layers a little bit and really get at the heart issue. Sometimes, parents, we make our families, our children, an idol. And then we aren't willing to let that go because we've enjoyed having the little kids make up the family for so long and all of a sudden we have 20 and 22 year old little kids and we don't want to let them go and and that really has become an idolatrous thing in our lives and every bit as much as a problem as the children of Israel with their idolatry so uh, we just uh, put a little bit different dressing on it and we think it's okay Um, but it's kind of the, the underlying issue here really becomes a spiritual issue and we need to identify it and then deal with it. Hmm. Oh, that's, that's good. So let's say a parent you know, pours their heart and soul into parenting a child. They, they've done everything that they can. They've tried to live a godly, consistent life. They've disciplined their child. They've nurtured their child. They've made sure their child was in church and their child gets to college, walks away from the Lord. Has that parent failed? Well, no, definitely not. And here we need to uh, come back to again to an, a foundational issue in our understanding and in our theology, and that's the sovereignty of God. We need to remember that there is only one who saves any individual, and that's the Lord himself. There's nothing we can do as parents to save our kids. We can, we can do what we know is right, but ultimately we leave it up to God. Um, I'm reminded of a good resource. Um, I think Jim Neuheiser's the author, and the title of the book is You Never Stop Being a Parent. And it kind of deals with wayward children, and the relationship is different than when they were small. We never stop praying for them. We uh, can uh, continue to be a testimony to them of God's goodness. But in the end, um, they may or may not be saved. That is God's prerogative. And we need to be okay with that Um, just because God is sovereign for no other reason. And we don't fully understand it. We certainly don't like it. But uh, there are many things that God sovereignly chooses to do that don't fit with what our understanding at the moment would dictate. Hmm. No, that's, I think, really remembering God's sovereignty is crucial to a lot of aspects of life. And remembering that. God's plan is not simple, it's complex in the sense that he's controlling everything, not just one thing. And it may be, you know, how many stories have have we heard of where a parent prays for their child faithfully every day, they pass away, the parent does, and then the child becomes a, a believer. And why did God not allow the parent to see the salvation of their child while they were living? That's one of those mysterious uh, questions which we don't have the answer to, but we can have faith in the fact that God did that for a reason. Right. And remember, again, that God, for us parents, is making us more like Christ continually. And the best way to do that is through trials and suffering. And um, we don't like that, certainly. I never pray for God to bring more trials and suffering my way. But if he chooses to do that, I know that it's ultimately for my good. Remember, Romans 8, all things work together for good to those who are the called. And so if that means that I never see my child saved, that's God's choice. You know, a very difficult thing to speak of and to experience in reality. But um, who am I to tell God that he doesn't know what he's doing in this case? Hmm. It's very Job-esque, you know, who can, who can open their mouth against the Almighty who created all things and who is, is powerful enough to control all things. Well, moving on to another stage of life, as it were, and it's fitting, kind of at the opening of the episode, I said we wanted to start at kind of the beginning of life and end of life scenario, and that's kind of how you introduced, uh, you know, how your thoughts have been on this, this subject uh, for, for a while now, is... There, there's a trans. There's another transition, a very important transition that ha- happens. And I, and again, I think as Westerners, especially, uh, we often neglect this part of the process, and we don't like to think about what it means to get old and and ha- to have aging parents. And whereas at the beginning of life, you have parents taking care of children, there there's a transition that happens at the end of life, and 
I was hoping maybe you could talk a little bit about that. What does what is the relationship between children and parents as there's this transition into um, elderly status? Well, yeah, that's a good question, Peter. And um, we need to realize that if our parents live long enough, uh, they will not be able to care for themselves as they once did. And that can take many different forms and it can happen at many different times. Uh, but I, I believe it's biblical that children should care for their parents. And uh, then the, the difficulty comes in, in deciding exactly what that care is. So when we're talking about the specifics then, um, when, and I would add too, I think uh, some people, well, and I would guess maybe I should ask you about this too, because I think some people are hesitant to embrace that responsibility. Uh, maybe, maybe there's, there's, I mean, as a, as a often middle-aged, even older child, uh, you still have a lot of life left ahead of you. I mean, maybe, maybe you're retired, maybe you're not, depending on how old your parents are, but there can be a lot of things that you want to do, you want to accomplish. Uh, is, it, is it ever justifiable to, to kind of pass that off saying, well, you know, for example, in some countries, maybe you have um, social health care and you can, you can just, you know, ship your parents off and, you know, go on a couple Caribbean cruises or something like that. Sure. Well, I, I don't think it's ever acceptable just to ignore your parents and, <laughs> as if, you know, especially since I'm your parent. Yes, yes. Um, and, and just pretend like uh, everything's fine and you're totally disconnected from them. Uh, the, the level of care that you provide, whether it, it could be as simple as maybe you um, help them with their finances because they're no longer able to process that mentally and really be comfortable with it. Maybe that's, maybe that's the extent of it, or maybe it is much more rigor, rigorous physical care. But again, this is different for everyone. And, um, I, I hope all the listeners here will remember one thing, and that is that, uh, never make judgments about what you see going on with elderly care if you've never been there. Um, for instance, some, somebody, a listener may be saying, and, and maybe they're a young person now, I will never put my, my mother in a nursing home. Well, um, that's fine to say when you're 30 years old and you're healthy and your mother's healthy, but things can change rapidly. And it could be that you're no longer able to provide care. Maybe you have physical issues yourself. Um, it could be that um, your parent is wheelchair bound and they require lifting for every activity of life. And if you can't lift them, what do you do? And so there's just so many things like that, uh, that can happen. And, um, we just need to be gracious and, and realize that until we've been in the situation, we don't understand all that's involved and things that seemed very doable when we were young are not that way when maybe we're 60 or 70 years are old ourselves and we're still looking at caring for a parent. Hmm. No, that's, that's super helpful and wise, I think, to just recognize that there are going to be some differences. And, and well, I think that often parallels even parenting. Uh, each and every parent is responsible to parent their own children, not, not somebody else's children. And each child will often require different uh, aspects of parental oversight. And I think that the same thing applies to the end of life as well, where in some cases families are going to, maybe they aren't able to do their, their own care. And so they have to hire parts of that process out. And I think that that is uh, acceptable and where, where possible that should be taken advantage of. So when we think about, when we do think about this, this end of life process, there are a couple, uh, perhaps complicating factors. I think of some you know, some listeners and, uh, you know, this is a pretty common experience. I think, uh, you, you have an elderly uh, parent who is not a believer. Maybe you're a first generation believer. Uh, and, and how does that change the process at all? How, how should one think about, uh, caring for their parents as they're getting older and, and, uh, getting close to passing away if they're unbelievers? Well, again, it's going to depend on, on the parent. Um, but essentially if you're a believer caring for an unbelieving parent, um, 
I don't think you change much about what you're doing. You still can speak to the Lord and and speak to them of the Lord, and uh, you're still praying for them, and, and truly you're loving them in however you're serving them, and that is truly Christ's love being shown through you. So um, certainly some of the discussions may be different than you would have if you had a, a believing parent who had uh, a very deep faith and you could speak about what was to come. Um, the, that, the nuances there will certainly be different, but very much of it would be the same because essentially you're loving them. Hmm. No, that's that's good. I do think oh, it's kind of like everyday life. In one sense, you don't necessarily check if somebody's a believer whether or not you're you're loving and kind to them. I mean, I think the undergirding biblical principle, according to First Timothy five, is that you take care of those who are your own, and if you don't do that, you're actually worse than an unbeliever. That's what right, Paul says. Right. And so it's it it is our obligation to make sure we're taking care of one another. But I think maybe you might have more. Uh, opportunities to witness to your parents. Obviously, you can share the love of Christ, but again, some in some family situations, perhaps the parents have made it clear they don't want to hear any more about that. I, I'm curious, in a, in a situation like that, this is kind of an off-the-cuff question, I guess, but let's say you have a parent that uh, is you know, obstinate against the gospel and says, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear any more about this Jesus, you know, um, should somebody just not tell them about Jesus then and just keep their mouth shut and and be kind and loving? You know what? How do you think about that? Well, yeah, that's that's a tough situation. Um, certainly, you you don't want to um, uh, get them upset every day. You know, by by bringing up a topic they don't want to hear about over and over. But one of the interesting things that happens at the end of life is God graciously strips away all the things that have been distracting us from Him. Hmm. You know, uh, people can no longer live in their own home. All their friends die. They can no longer drive. Maybe they don't understand their finances anymore. Maybe all their finances have been consumed with health care. It doesn't take very long, and the Lord can take everything that people have held dear in life away. And so we never want to totally close the door and just say, I'm done giving them the gospel. You know, because things can change. And and all of a sudden, a person can wake up one day and all the things I held dear, you know, my spouse, my friends, my money, my things, they're all gone. Hmm. And and all of a sudden, you know, they can look differently on the gospel. And of course, again, God is the one who will save them and prepare their heart. But um, it can happen. And that's why I I term this as God is sometimes being very gracious by putting someone in a nursing home by causing them to be an invalid before they die. And we need to, to remember that perhaps that's the case. Hmm. No, that's, that's really wise. So you've, you've been walking through this process for you know, a handful of years now with your parents and with mom's parents. So I know I remember talking to somebody recently, actually just this last week or the week before, where they had walked through the similar process of, of their mother uh, passing away, and they just said it was so burdening, it was, it was overwhelming, and they didn't know where to start, how to, how to process this. So I, I'm assuming many of our listeners are either you know, getting close to going through this process or at least thinking about it. Do you have any practical advice about how somebody who has older parents can start to prepare to make that a little easier on both their parents as they're getting older, as well as their own families? Sure. Um, Quite simply, um, we need to start talking to our elderly parents about this. And uh, we did this, Julie and I did this with her parents and my parents about um, three or four years ago. And and it had come up um, kind of tangentially in the past, you know, 10 or 20 years, like they, they, um, uh, redid a will and they would mention that maybe give us a copy, but, but that's really not enough. And so, uh, what we did here maybe three or four years ago is, uh, we, um, had them designate a power of attorney and I became power of attorney for all of our parents because that's kind of a an administrative strength of mine. 
And then we also had them complete a healthcare directive and went through the questions with them. And, and those are kind of difficult questions. Like if you're, if you're being uh, kept alive on life support and there's little medical certainty of you ever returning to the previous physical condition that you were, um, do you want to stay on life support? And um, j- those kinds of difficult questions, and that's a, an individual answer there, but to have that specified so if it's needed in the future, there's there's no um, pressure or there's no uncertainty as to what their wishes are. And since we've done that, um, we've used the um, power of attorney and the health care directive is also there when parents have gone into the hospital, they want to know, is that available uh, in case, you know, life-saving efforts are, are needed. Uh, the other thing that is... Uh, a very good idea. So those are really practical things, and they should be requirements. If if you don't remember anything else today, and you you have elderly parents, the power of attorney and the health care directive, get them done. Mm. You can find the forms online for your state and fill them out. And the power of attorney typically needs to be notarized. I mean, just stop by your bank and have them witness that and get it notarized. Um, <clears throat> there are other issues that uh, become more complex. If there's a long-term uh, chronic illness that is terminal, and uh, here we need to, this requires more thought, and we need to think biblically about this. Um, I, I like the phrase "finishing well." As Christians, in particular, we want to finish the race well. We we don't want to mess up at the end because that might be all people remember how we messed up at the end. But uh, there's a really good resource that I'll leave the listeners with. And it's called uh, Departing in Peace by a guy by the name of Bill Davis. And he steps through some of these difficult situations, such as um, a, a chronically ill elderly person, they're terminal, you know, what kind of heroic measures should really be used to keep them alive? And is it valid if someone says, well, we need to keep them alive at all costs because we need to give God time to work a miracle? Well, you know, theologically speaking, our sovereign God is eternal. He's not constrained by time. So God doesn't need time to work a miracle. But, but again, just to think through these things and understand and know what the person wants, the elderly person, and also know how we need to respond as their children rather than letting emotions rule the day when the time comes. Hmm. Oh, that's that's really helpful advice, and I'll try to put a link to some of those resources in the in the description of the podcast so that people can access those. I think that'd be that'd be really helpful. Uh, another another question, and I think maybe this will be the last one, just for sake of time. But I think this could be a helpful one too, because as as a parent who gets older and who wants to try to, it's kind of related to the previous question, who wants to ease the the child's their children's responsibility make things easier for them. What what can they do personally, or even as you think about how how you know you're becoming quite aged yourself, I was just, <laughs> uh, as you find yourself aging, um, do you think about what personally you can do then um, that that could help uh, help your children, you know, as as they prepare for for this season of life? Sure, that's an important question, and it's not only helping your children but also helping your spouse if you should pass. You, re- you really need to think about uh, what happens when you die and make it as easy as possible for those who follow you. And again, set a good example. And so uh, we need to have uh, a will in order. We need to have our assets organized. And we, we need to make sure that others can find critical information about those assets. And um, there's lots of information out there. And, and some of these are are in the legal realm and so don't don't get your advice from your barber or your car mechanic i mean th- these these require input from someone who specializes in estate planning and probate but uh, that doesn't mean you need to run to the lawyer's office and start shelling out lots of money eventually you may need to do that but um there is a a good blog called the organized afterlife 
by a, a lady attorney by the name of uh, Jen Gumbel, and she just talks about these kinds of things openly. And again, so often we don't want to talk about death, um, but let's just talk about it. And, and It happens to everybody. Yeah, and make, make decisions, make it easy, really show your family how much you love them by having things organized before you go. Hmm. And uh, none of us knows when the day is, but certainly for me, I'm 66 years old. There's more days behind me than are ahead of me in all likelihood. So why not be organized? Why not make it easy? And um, this really set a pattern for generations to come. Then you can do the same, Peter. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's it's true. I just want to observe something as well. I think that the the areas that I've that I've really observed people where they struggle a lot is a lot of times, I think picking up on the theme of organization, a lot of times, a lot of where, where it's really a struggle is when, you know, there's, there's a lot of hoarding that goes on with possessions. And then when the parents pass away, now the children have to spend weeks getting rid of material possessions. And that's a whole emotional process in and of itself. And just on a practical level, that can be really helpful just to kind of whittle down your own possessions, uh, kind of live simply before before you make somebody else go through that. And I've seen that kind of how you've you've dealt with uh, you know various older couples, even in the church. Yeah, and that's really good advice. Um, you don't want to die and leave four storage units plumb full of junk. You thought it was valuable or something you would get to someday, and you didn't. Um, even if you have to give it away. I mean, just do it. And there are people, and, and certainly there are people listening to the podcast here who are just overwhelmed. They, they, they say, oh, you just don't understand how much I have. There's just no way I can do this. I can't physically do it anymore. You can um, find individuals or companies that will come in and do it for you. So th- really it comes down to the choice. Either you're going to do it or your kids are going to do it. And if that means you have to hire somebody to do it, isn't that still better than your kids having to hire somebody to do it? And so it's it's really a very practical thing about loving your children and just getting it taken care of, even if it means four or five dumpsters. I mean, let, let's let's not cling too tightly to the junk of this world. Hmm. No, that's that's good good advice. I'm reminded of uh, I, I was tracking so, some of the listeners to the podcast uh, might might be familiar with a, an individual by the name of Rodney Decker, and he's since passed away from cancer uh, years ago now. But uh, he was a phenomenal New Testament scholar, and one of the things that uh, just really stood out about him was his love for the Lord, his academic uh, rigor. I mean, he's just a phenomenal ish, uh, individual. And he got cancer, and uh, he seemed to pass away well before his time, as we would often think about it, obviously the Lord's sovereign. But one of the things that really stood out to me is I was tracking his slow decline, and one of the he, he would blog himself until he was too weak to blog about it anymore, and then so his wife would start to blog. And after, I think it was maybe after a couple of weeks after he passed away, she wrote you know a eulogy about she wrote she wrote this eulogy about how just his godliness exhibited itself in every single scenario and i think what stood out to me most was she said his godliness came out in in how even in his last weeks of life he made sure that every t was crossed i was dotted so that his family wouldn't have to worry about anything after he he passed like he had gotten everything in order there were no questions so that his passing was as painless on them as possible. And I just thought that was such a great example of godliness, how he wasn't concerned about, oh, I need to live it up the last couple, you know, uh, weeks or months of my life or anything. You know, he was, he was loving, uh, to the end really. And I just thought that was, that was a phenomenal example. Yeah. Finishing well, that should be Finishing the goal well. for all of us. Amen. Well, really appreciate you joining us on this podcast. Yeah, this is a lot of fun. I think I've been podcasting for, I think, 2017, and this was the first time you've joined me on the podcast. So I don't know what you did to make it odd, but uh, really appreciate you joining. Glad to be here. Well, as always, just want to appreciate you listening. And I do, I do thank you, those of you who have reached out by email or through the contact form on the website. 
I just want to remind you as well, people have told me I need to start reminding you that if you enjoy the podcast or if you like listening, you're supposed to subscribe and you're supposed to like it and, you know, give reviews on social media. I feel bad about asking for that. So you can do that if you want. But realistically, I'm just thankful that anybody even listens to this. Actually, I'm not sure if anyone's listening to it because you're on it. So you're not going to listen to it anymore. So I'm just kidding. But I really, really enjoy being able to do this kind of resource. And so may the Lord be glorified in the process. You can always find out more about me at petergaiman.com. You can also find out about Shepherd's Theological Seminary at shepherds.edu. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you.